Hello and welcome to another episode of Interactive Biology TV, where we're making biology fun. My name is Leslie Samuel, and in this episode, episode 65, I'm going to be talking about the anatomy and functions of the frontal lobe. But before I talk about that, let's talk about the folds in the cerebrum. Now, when we're talking about gyri, we're talking about the folds. So you can see here in this brain, we have all these little folds that go all throughout the brain. Those are called gyri. If you're dealing with one of them, you're not going to say gyri, but you're going to say gyrus. Then we have the sulci or the fissures, and sometimes we use these interchangeably. But these are the depressions in the brain that define the lobar boundaries. So here we have the different lobes, and you can see we have all of these depressions. In other words, we have all of these grooves that are going throughout the different lobes of the brain, and those are called sulci, and in some cases we call them fissures. So with that understanding, let's look at the frontal lobe in the brain. Now, the frontal lobe, we have two major boundaries that define the frontal lobe. Over here, we have the central sulcus, and you can see that's going through here. And that is the posterior aspect. Okay, so that's towards the back. The posterior aspect of the frontal lobe, uh, the boundary is the central sulcus. And then if we go inferiorly here, we have the lateral sulcus, or we can call it the sylvian sulcus. So that's this boundary here on the inferior end of the frontal lobe. So the central sulcus posteriorly, and the sylvian or lateral sulcus inferiorly. And this here would be the frontal lobe. Now the first thing I want to talk about is this section here that's called the precentral gyrus. And here you can see in this case it's called the anterior central gyrus, but this is the precentral gyrus. And the function of that region is it serves as the primary motor cortex. So it's basically getting motor signals from different parts of the brain and it's integrating it in this region, the precentral gyrus. And this is where a lot of that motor function is integrated. Now, just anterior to that, it's not shown in this image, but I'm just going to kind of draw a section in here coming from the from this part all the way uh, maybe it's not that wide but um it's kind of it's not exact but this is the premotor cortex which makes sense if this is the primary motor cortex and this is right before that it's the premotor cortex and here we have kind of an area that we call the supplemental motor area so it's a supplemental motor area, and that plays a big role in initiating movement. So you want to move. There's an initiation that has to happen, and this has something to do with that process of initiating movements. Now, as I said before, the boundaries aren't necessarily definitely defined. I can't say that it goes from right here to right there. But in this area here... Let's show this area. I'll just color it in a little bit. We have what's called the frontal eye fields. Let me write that out. Frontal eye fields. And that is involved in the movement of the eyes, but a specific movement. When I look to the left and I look to the right, my eyes are moving horizontally. The frontal eye fields are involved in the horizontal movement of the eye. Now let's move on. Uh, then we have, if we go anterior from that area, we have the superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus. So superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyrus. And in the left hemisphere of the brain, in the frontal lobe, we have an area that we call the Broca's motor speech area. 
And that has a big part to do with the motor components of speech. So you're speaking. I am speaking into this microphone right now. My mouth is moving in certain ways, and there are muscles that are controlling that. And this broker's motor speech area is very much involved in that process. Once again, it's in the left hemisphere, not the right. And that deals with motor control of speech. Now, if there's damage to this area, if something happens and that causes this area to be damaged, the result of that can be what we call broker's aphasia. And when you have that condition, it causes a form of language impairment where you cannot speak well. It's not that you can't comprehend, but the motor control of that speech doesn't function as well because the broker's motor speech area is damaged. And I have a little video here to show an example of that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. Now tell me what this thing was with your legs last week or week before. Uh, no good. Uh, Uh, ache and What'd you do about it? Uh, home a doctor and legs. Walking, no good. No good, uh, huh? And you're a fellow who likes to walk, too. Oh, jeez. Huh? Oh, boy, oh, boy. And it's getting too cold. Yeah. To run your John Deere tractor, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Up and yeah. downtown. Yeah. What'd the doctor tell you, Jack? Uh, don't know. He doesn't know what's going on, no. huh? No. Did you feel sick in any other way? No. No, no. Uh, uh, ache. Yeah, legs uh, ached. Yeah. Uh. Did you feel weak? No, no, no. No, uh. Maybe you had a touch of rheumatiz. Don't know, <laughs> but gee. Uh. So this is an example of Broca's aphasia, and you can see he had some problems speaking and uh, not necessarily in comprehension, but in just the motor control and forming the words and, and putting together long strings of words to make complete sentences. And that is an example of Broca's aphasia. Now, if we look all the way to the anterior section, you'll see that we have the prefrontal cortex, and that plays a very important role in the process of intellectual functioning and uh, emotional responses and so on. So intellectual and emotional events, that has a lot to do with what happens in the prefrontal cortex. Now there's another area that we cannot see in this picture, and in order to see it, we need to remove a section from here because it's deeper in, it's more medial. So we're gonna do that now and take a look at that. Here you can see we've removed a part of the temporal lobe and part of the frontal lobe. And then here there's an area that we call the insula. You can see it over here and you can also see right here. This is the insular cortex. This picture over here uh, is a coronal section of the brain. So we just take a section of the brain right in this area and you can see the insula right here. 
Now, depending on what book you read, you might get different explanations as to the function of the insula. Um, anything from taste sensation to emotions to thoughts, um, pain sensation, visceral sensation in terms of you know feeling hungry and thirsty. Uh, that's attributed to that region. So uh, we're not 100% clear on how this works, but we do have uh, some suggestions as to its function. And the last thing I want to talk about is what we see right here. And this structure is called the corpus callosum, and that is responsible for connecting the two hemispheres and you can see as the cortex goes medially, it borders in the inferior aspect with that corpus callosum. And we can see it even clearer here. We can see the corpus callosum. And you can see it starts here in the frontal cortex and it goes back here. So this is the corpus callosum. Uh, if we're dealing with the frontal cortex, that does border with the corpus callosum inferiorly. And that's shown very well right there. That's pretty much all I want to cover for this episode. As usual, you can visit the website at interactive-biology.com for more biology videos. You can find transcripts of all the videos and a number of other resources to help make biology fun. This is Leslie Samuel. That's it for now. And I'll see you in the next one.